afternoon. Yes. Hi. Um, welcome to um, our Weatherhead event today. Um, we are very honored to have Mr. Daniel Russell come speak to us about the um, Trump administration's policy towards East Asia. Um, please let me introduce uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, Mr. Russell joined the Asian Society Policy Institute as diplomat in residence and senior fellow in April 2017. Um, he's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service at the United States Department of State and has most recently served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. And prior to his appointment as Assistant Secretary on July well, 2013, Mr. Russell served the, at the White House as Special Assistant to the President and National Security Council, Senior Director for Asian Affairs. And during his tenure there, he helped formulate President Obama's strategic rebalance to the Asian Pacific region, including efforts to strengthen alliances, deepen U.S. engagement in, with multilateral organizations, and expand cooperation with emerging powers in the region. Um, so I think we all have many questions to ask, but before that, uh, we would like to hear from Mr. Russell. It is my great honor that I've been sharing a panel with you for the third time in this past couple of months, and very um, happy to do so, so please. <coughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Columbia. It's great to be here with uh, Jerry and Andy and other distinguished colleagues. And thanks to the intrepid scholars who came out uh, in the snow. So the Trump administration was greeted by a pretty challenging uh, environment in East Asia when it came into office. Uh, there, first of all, the significant global factors, uh, the headwinds of the after effects of globalization, uh, AI, automation, this 21st century problems, transnational threats, uh, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, terrorism, uh, and particularly in East Asia, the, the risk from violent extremism, from uh, Marawi to Xinjiang, the risk of radicalization of minorities. The stress between, uh, uh, the stress that emerged from the rise of China and more importantly from the behavior of China, uh, including something that's being discussed a great deal now, which is sort of the, the, the clash between the disappointment over expectations uh, for what engagement with China would produce and China's own, or at least Xi Jinping's own, uh, vision of what China should become, uh, the China dream. Uh, of course, the unprecedented improvement in North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile uh, capability and its, its dogged determination to, uh, to use that uh, for purposes of extortion. Um, and very serious setbacks to democracy and good governance uh, in East Asia, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, the Philippines, and, and a lot to worry about elsewhere, Mongolia, Malaysia, Pacific Islands. But there are also some pretty significant challenges that flow from the actions and the choices that the uh, administration itself made. Uh, first and foremost, the withdrawal from TPP, which has had not only uh, commercial and economic costs, but uh, it's been a setback in strategic terms as well. And the reason I say that is that the withdrawal from TPP literally took the US out of the game. And interestingly, but unhappily, uh, the fact that the TPP 11 had not just held on by their fingernails, but actually put together uh, a new uh, TPP without the United States, which in my view was a very good thing, the more that one thinks about it, uh, really represents an issue uh, in which the region has begun learning that it needs to diversify. Uh, we have inadvertently taught our partners that they should not rely on us. And that's clearly not the direction that we want to go. And on top of that, uh, there have been no takers for the administration's uh, suggestion that it wants to make bilateral trade deal. I think walking away from the uh, Paris deal 
uh, came with some costs, uh, slashing the foreign affairs and foreign aid funding, uh, incurs costs, and leaving various positions, foreign policy positions on the front, similarly. You can see mixed messages uh, from the administration on a number of fronts, and I don't mean, the, well, I mean, it's, at one level it's, you know, President Trump versus President Trump with uh, competing and contradictory uh, tweets and, and, and claims China is working hard to help us on North Korea versus China's doing nothing but could solve this problem in a minute. Uh, Kim Jong-un is a smart cookie and uh, we can make a deal with him. Uh, Kim Jong-un is a short, fat, little <laughs> rocket man. Uh, so it raises questions, you know, is the administration getting ready for diplomacy, as uh, Secretary Tillerson has at times intimated? Is the administration getting ready for war, as this talk of a bloody nose uh, suggests? Uh, there is uh, also, you know, contradictory signals coming out of uh, the cabinet itself. Uh, and between the president and cabinet secretaries, some inconsistencies. If you listen to the State of the Union address, then you'd think that human rights is a, is a core component of our uh, approach, our foreign policy, and yet uh, didn't seem to feature in any of the conversations with Xi Jinping or with Duterte, uh, with other leaders. Um, there's talk about a uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, on the face of it, uh, the terminology and the precepts look a lot like the Obama administration's rebalance to Asia, but don't seem to be borne out, at least yet, by the administration's uh, actions. So there seems to be something of a say, do, uh, gap there. Similarly, in the South China Sea, other than periodic uh, freedom of navigation uh, operations by the U.S. Navy, which are uh, global and long-term features of our practice and seventh fleet's operation, uh, the South China Sea seems to have fallen off of the substantive agenda. Um, there's some ambiguity about whether countries like Japan and Korea are our allies or they are free riders. Uh, are we irrevocably committed to their defense or are we getting played for a sucker because we're defending them while they're uh, making money off of unfair trade practices? So, so I, I, I would say that Although there are people in the administration who argue that there is uh, a method to this and some tactical benefit from these inconsistencies, I tend to think that uh, unpredictability, while an asset for a guerrilla uh, group, isn't an asset for a superpower. But more broadly, what we may be seeing is something of a shift from uh, the rules-based order and systems-oriented approach uh, that we're familiar with from previous administrations, not limited to Obama, uh, to America first, to uh, a more nationalist zero-sum approach that's perhaps a little more about blood and soil uh, than it is about principle. When you look at the three administration documents that uh, have been released in the last few months, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the Nuclear Posture Review, uh, all of which are you know, built on the foundations of the past administrations. What you see is a kind of tough, tough uh, principle of struggle, uh, a hyper-competitive, doggy dog adversarial, Darwinian, I don't know, even Hobbesian, world It's less focused on the multiple challenges in a complex security environment, you know, terrorism, WMD, uh, cyber, political instability, and very focused on adversaries, antagonists, uh, 
enemies, on strategic competition with revisionist powers, China and Russia, and they're largely lumped together, as the central challenge to US prosperity and security. So speaking as a diplomat, it's not that I'm contesting the concern that China is a revisionist power. Uh, I'm not contesting the allegation that China exercises its claimed sovereignty and its, pursues its interests at the expense of its neighbors. There's plenty of reason to believe, and you can make a good case, that uh, China seeks uh, hegemonic dominance in Asia and seeks to undercut the US-led network of alliances. I mean, these, these, there are arguments there. And there's plenty to complain about in terms of China's authoritarian system, its prejudicial treatment of foreign companies, of NGOs, of academics, of media, let alone its own citizens and its own minorities. So this isn't a matter of rose-colored glasses for me. But strategic rivalry between the great powers is the very thing that we want to avoid, not to use as the basis of our policy. And second, and maybe more to the point, if we treat China like an enemy, we are going to wind up with an enemy. Uh, so I don't advocate that, uh, that approach. I think these strategies also have implications for India. Um, not surprisingly, India, of course, is concerned with the impact that China's rise and China's behavior has on its interests, its economy, its borders, uh, its national security. And it isn't surprising that, China, that India should work to up its game in East Asia and to work with Japan, Australia, improve relations, uh, hedge a bit, uh, build stronger relations with the United States as well. And yeah, I think the US can and should enlist India in a positive regional effort to strengthen the rule of law and to create pressure, I mean, a good kind of pressure, peer pressure, uh, for China to play within the rules. But is it that we like India because it's a champion of democratic values, or we like India because it uh, has utility to the United States as a counterweight and a check to, to China? Any policy that creates the impression that we are seeking to use India as a blunt instrument against China in the great game is going to run into problems quickly. And not only with China, but India is going to let that happen. No Asian country wants to have to make a binary choice between going with the US or going with China. And what's so important and valuable about the rules-based system is that it's what allows countries, including small countries, to make their own choices, not to be forced into lining up behind one or the other of opposing great powers. So, you know, I've touched on the fact that there's uh, continuity in a number of areas despite some big rhetorical differences. The priority on sustaining alliances, um, and for example, the kind of decision that I would have made, which was to begin the president's visit to Asia in Tokyo and Seoul, um, that's very familiar. Now, there are a number of factors behind that. North Korea makes it a lot easier than it otherwise would be to remember who your allies are. Uh, I think Prime Minister Abe has played a role, certainly, in putting uh, allies and alliances in Japan in the field of vision of President Trump. Um, we also have a very military heavy uh, senior group in the US government, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, it's in our national interest to sustain our alliances. And I will say that uh, you know there is also a certain amount of momentum, inner inertia, or kind of autopilot uh, in some policies. Um, North Korea. North Korea as a top national security priority is another area of continuity. Um, the basic strategy, and I'll talk more about this, is, is largely unchanged. 
leader level engagement with China. Um, Mar-a-Lago looked an awful lot to me like Sunnylands, uh, on, on design an early opportunity to get together on a semi-official off-site venue with the uh, new president in order to establish the leader the leader connection that plays an important role in uh, US China relations. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And the Trump administration is pushing on the same issues intellectual property, cyber enabled uh, theft, economic uh, information, tech transfer, market access, opioid, same sort of issue set that the Obama administration pursued. And the trip that the president took to Asia, as well as the visits of the vice president, uh, the secretary of state, secretary of defense, and May, um, you know, these are consistent with uh, what the previous administrations have done. So you have this interesting mix of consistency, continuity on the one hand, contradictions and confusion uh, on the other. So let me just dig down a bit on two of the obvious priority issues in uh, uh, United States engagement in East Asia, North Korea and China, the US-China relationship, starting with North Korea. The Trump administration is very fond of declaring that the era of strategic patience, as they call it, is over. Now, I worked in the Obama administration, worked on North Korea. We didn't really call it strategic patience, um, but all right, <laughs> setting labels aside, what that policy was, what strategic patience represented was very, very tight coordination between Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul, uh, upping the ante on Beijing, pushing Beijing to use more and more of its leverage to try to get uh, better behavior from the North. Building the pressure of sanctions uh, and sanctions implementation and enforcement, and doing so against the backdrop of strong military resolve, uh, deterrence, and defense. And lastly, keeping the door open for diplomacy, uh, continuing to press and ping and push for diplomatic openings, but at the same time, being wary of the you know, Charlie Brown, Lucy, and the football syndrome, where the North Koreans dangled a kind of phony offer, and we raced for it, and they, uh, they essentially snatched away uh, demanding more. Instead, we insisted on uh, negotiations, not just talk, although we certainly talked to the North Koreans. And we insist that they be credible in that they have to, maybe not on day one, but they have to at some point address the nuclear issue. Because North Korea, contrary to popular belief, would be delighted to talk to the United States. They'd be happy to negotiate, say, the withdrawal of US forces or the repayment, the payment of reparations. I mean, there's plenty they'd like to negotiate. Uh, their game is to see if they can't get us to the table with the nuclear issue off the table. And the, the purpose, uh, in the first instance, is to obtain legitimization of North Korea's nuclear status. And that's something that we were determined, and uh, the strategic patience approach was adamant about not uh, agreeing to. Uh, it was not wishful thinking. So when you subtract the bluster and the threats and the rhetoric and the tweets and so on, there is substantial continuity in US policy towards the DPRK, apply maximum pressure, primarily through sanctions, conduct robust military exercises uh, for deterrence, but keep the door open to negotiations. There are differences, but the overall structure is the same. And so in that context, I think that the administration's uh, tolerance of uh, North Korea attending the Olympics and of the uh, South's willingness to explore the uh, offer of 
the proposal for inter-Korean dialogue is uh, is a sensible. The question is, ironically, whether uh, the Trump administration will actually have the strategic patience to see out the maximum pressure and engagement strategy. Will they will they let that uh, process unfold, or will they yield to the pressure to lash out in some kinetic uh, way, bloody nose, or the temptation to just grab a little peace and quiet, uh, even if that means paying for it, renting a little de-escalation, uh, which is, as though, as Bob Gates used to say, you know, buying the same horse twice. Uh, and when you combine moonshine, the hunger that the South Korean government has for uh, inter-Korean rapprochement with the art of the deal, uh, then you don't know what you're going to get. U.S.-China relations. I've already spent some time on the risk of framing the relationship in adversarial, antagonistic terms. Um, what I point out is that that risk is compounded by the diminishing bilateral cooperation between the U.S. and China on global issues. The, you know, the, the poster child for U.S.-China cooperation was the U.S.-China uh, climate change agreement, uh, which really is an extraordinary instance of uh, the two of us finding a way to uh, converge our respective interests and then use that as the nucleus for a bigger global uh, and transformative agreement. Other examples are the work that we, the cooperation that we developed in global health, uh, growing out of the uh, Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, on cyber, the, the four-point cyber agreement that we negotiated with Meng Jinju with the Chinese in 2015 and averted a real crisis. Um, instead, we're experiencing a contraction uh, of cooperation in, on global issues at a moment of increased bilateral friction over trade and, and other issues. Secondly, I point out that there is a deceleration and a contraction in the institutional engagement that has always been a, within governments that has always been a big part of the official U.S.-China relationship. Whether it was the strategic economic dialogue that Hank Paulson ran, or the strategic and economic dialogues that the <coughs> Obama administration pursued, as well as a laundry list of acronyms of other uh, bilateral groupings, um, there has been a shift towards almost an exclusive leader-to-leader uh, -leader, uh, engagement. Now, I'm a major proponent of that in the U.S.-China relationship. I think it's essential, and I had a, I had a role in uh, facilitating and designing it when Xi Jinping was first vice president and subsequently China's leader. Uh, so it's important. Uh, and it's more important than ever, I think, as collective leadership in China seems to shift towards, I won't say one man rule, but let's just say the core. Um, but so this leader level engagement is sufficient, is uh, necessary but not sufficient to get things done in the U.S. China relationship because our systems are complex and the problems are complex. Uh, moreover, I'd say uh, too heavy reliance on personal ties between you know, Mr. Trump and Mr. Xi uh, just may not be suited to the realities of our two systems or of their personalities or their politics. You know, you can have great chemistry, you can have beautiful chocolate cakes. That's not really part of the Marxist-Leninist kind of playbook. <laughs> uh, and I don't think they fit so they don't seem to sit comfortably with the pronouncements of China as an adversary, China as a threat. That said, don't get me wrong, uh, you know, there's a well-founded concern in the U.S. and in much of the world about China's behavior. Now, I make a fundamental distinction between 
uh, what China is and what China does, in the sense that, uh, not Christian, but it's, let's say, hate the sin, not the sinner. Uh, China is what China is. But what China does is a matter of legitimate uh, opinion and, and debate and concern. The U.S. business community has legitimate concerns about forced tech transfer, unfair barriers to market access, lack of reciprocity. The U.S. security circles have legitimate concerns about militarization of outposts in disputed uh, areas in the South China Sea, lack of transparency uh, in China's military modernization programs, and so on. Uh, think tanks, universities, media have legitimate concerns about uh, their inability to operate in China, or for that matter, what's called shark power, the influence operations. And, uh, the organized use of unseemly tools, uh, coercion and deception, uh, to, to uh, challenge journalistic freedom or academic integrity. There's legitimate concern in, in the political sphere about uh, the kind of interference that has been documented in, in Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. And there's widespread concern in the international community about uh, China's occasional reliance on economic leverage as tools to retaliate and punish uh, neighbors who act in a way that they find uncongenial or uh, also about increased political repression at home. So look, there's you know there, there are a lot of there are a lot of concerns, and I and I think that as a result uh, of these factors and others, that U.S.-China relations are probably in for a fairly rough ride in 2018. So, you know, I started by making clear that the. Administration that came into office was greeted by a host of very formidable challenges in East Asia, not of its own making. There were some that it layered on top of that. Every administration faces a, a learning curve. Every administration needs to deal simultaneously with foreign policy problems, domestic political problems, economic problems, security problems. Uh, every administration struggles over the shortfall of time and bandwidth. Uh, my colleagues used to say constantly when I was at the NSC, the most precious commodity in, in Washington, if not the world, is the time of the President of the United States. It's certainly true with the Obama. Uh, and generally, there just aren't a lot of easy answers. So we're now in well into year two of the administration. The front burner issues. US-China relations, uh, North Korea are boiling, if not boiling over. Uh, so I think for those reasons, we should open the floor now and see what kind of great advice and answers you all can <laughs> provide to me. Thank you.